the reason why we had to have this particular tool is to get to the following section. We're going to jump to 4.6. We're going to talk about cryptography. We're going to do div, we're going to do mod, we're going to do multiplication, we're going to need multiplicative inverses, we're going to need additive inverses, and we're going to need to do power mods. A base to a power modulo whatever, all of those operators are necessary for what we're going to work with. First off, I use the word cryptography. Uh, all cryptography is, is a function that goes from, say, A to a set, say B, and it goes like this, and that's F, and then I could go backwards, which means that if it goes backwards, I have F inverse. So what does that mean F must, if F inverse exists, what do I know about F? F must be a bijection. It must be one to one and on to. Onto strictly to, uh, under the strict sense that we can always limit the size of B to fit the perfect number of elements of A. In other words, we'll, we pick the domain in the range. Cryptography is just the study of these functions. That's it. Invertible functions. And except what we say is A on this left hand side is normally called like, you know, it's plain text. When I mean plain text, I mean you know what this symbol is. So it's the letter A, it's the name Mark, it's the word bridge, it's the picture of a cat. I don't care, right? It is a thing that is understood by all, at least all the people that we're working with. It's in plain text. It's in plain known concept. It's kind of an important part about human language, right? Human language, when we're, when we're going to do encoding, and things like that. We have to understand what language is. Language is ideas that are encoded in different ways, either phonographic or uh, logograms and symbolic in particular nature. But in the end, we have this, I agree, we all agree what A means. B, on the other hand, is not plain text, it's ciphered text or a cipher text which is we don't get it. It's unreadable. It's encrypted. F is the encryption function. And F inverse is the decryption. Function. Normally we're sitting here going, it's like, how in the world is me talking to my bank is something as simple as that? And the answer is, it is. <coughs> if you want to, and you could talk about how, how all forms of cryptography in particular work, they are a thing on the left that is understood, whether it's understood by a machine or understood by you, is mapped to mapped, one to one and on to, with a thing on the right that is not understood. Like if a normal person saw that, they'd be like, I have no idea what this is. It doesn't make sense to me. Right? Uh, examples of this. Uh, a could be the set of all sound ideas in English. Humans are really amazing. If you take two people who have no common language and you throw them in a room and say you have to live together forever, right? You put them on the middle. Guess what they will do within a very short period of time? They'll develop a language. If one had a language and the second had a language, they would usually form a common language. Normally, the intersection of those two languages is called a pidgin language. It's very interesting when you get consonant language people bumping up with uh, uh, tonal language peoples. So English did this all the time. We okay, ran around, went everywhere in the entire world, and so we have things like, uh-huh, uh-uh, that's not English. But do you know what I meant when I said uh-huh? That came from a tonal language. We don't even know where it came from. 
there's some arguments of here or there. Okay, right? That's not English. We ran into it, but we all understand what it means. Okay. So we just go through, and I would say English itself is the ultimate pidgin language. I like that word, venison. It's not English, it's French. I like it, it's venison. All right? We just absorb whatever sounds great, as long as we understand what, what it means. Right? Each of the sounds that I make, mark, and you simply know I say something like that, it means, you know, mark, right? And you have this idea that goes along with it. I was having a discussion with a student yesterday about that, and all of a sudden I realized, why is it that things like um, P or X cause all sorts of issues? When, and you notice that I tend to do things like something divides something implies that this times an int is that. But if I do things like x divides y implies x times c is equal to y, all of a sudden this sometimes makes sense when the other one gets people get hung up on. And all of a sudden I realized why was because since we use x and y all the time, they become an identity. It'd be like this. Cat divides dog implies cat times k is equal to dog. And you would look at this and say, that makes my brain hurt. And it's like, why not? I mean, cat's a variable. You know, but cat has a meaning. And all of a sudden I realized it's like, oh, if we constantly are using the same variables, what we're doing is we're applying meaning to those variables that are not meant to be there. So it's better to use symbols that have no meaning for the people you're working with, like squares and triangles, right? So it's like, oh, that's, that's why that makes sense. Anyways. But we have meaning in these things. And so we all understand the same mark is in English. But B could be the set of all sounds for ideas, say, in Spanish. And so what happens? Cat becomes, anybody know Spanish for cat? Gato. Now, if you didn't know Spanish and somebody's like, have you ever been around another person? Like you're, you're in the hallway and it's like, I'm pretty sure they're speaking, it sounds Russian because I've watched enough movies and heard people speak Russian, has accent like Russian, but I have no idea what they're saying. What did they do? They encoded it. So that was their encryption. And this was a common technique. Just speak in a language that the other people don't know. If this is a common language between us, we've encrypted it. I encrypt my ideas in sounds that we know, and then how do I decrypt it? I would convert from Spanish back to English for people who want to know English. It's just full idea encryption. This was used in World War II. How many bulls heard of the code talkers, right? Which was, you pick an actual human language that's complicated enough, that has its own sounds and everything else, it's nearly impossible to decrypt those sounds if you don't have some reference which is a person telling you what it is. Uh, other ones, this is kind of important. Um, language itself is a form of cryptography. I have the words say, well, actually here, let's stay with cat. I say cat, right? And I wrote it like this. But what I just said sound wise was cat. And I don't need to be able to write it. But I'll also do it this way. Ear, ear, eyes, eyes, whiskers, All right, cat. And then we could go to this idea of what's called a phonogram, or I could go to what's called a logogram, which, by the way, that's a logogram. A logogram is a symbolic object that represents the, the idea in its entirety. Um, so cat could also be, I cheated, I looked this one up. Cat in kanji, right? Now what's the difference between a logogram, there's a logogram, there is a logogram. A logogram is just simply the entire thing that I just said, the idea encoded into a single symbol. Is everybody okay with that looks like a cat? Kind of, sort of, right? But on the other hand, what's a phonogram? A phonogram is, if we all know how to talk, 
I'm just going to encode the sound. <clears throat> K -f, right? And so you see these symbols, and these symbols are recreate the sound. And then you read it, K -f, and then you say it, cat, oh, cat. And then all of a sudden, the sound has been recreated. So a phonogramic system, like your textbook, is really what? Just simply streams of sounds that has been coded. It's like an MP3 file, but in, in symbolic text that you visually see, and then you are the interpreter that puts the sounds back. Make sense? It's just a sound encoded file. Uh, what's amazing for us, though, to be literate in a logogram, you need about 3,000 symbols. So you have to memorize about 3,000 of those things. On the other hand, phonic systems don't require that. You just need to have what we have how many symbols that make sounds for it, normal English, American English. How many symbols do we got? 26, right? And the 26 have sounds and orders of them have sounds. But from those 26, we can generate whatever you want. But what happens over time, the more you read, you start to no longer see the sounds. The shape, all of a sudden, if you misspell things, When you put things in wrong order, it's still Mark. I know what you meant. Why? Because I'm not sounding it. I'm shape recognition. So all of a sudden, as you become literate and you know, say, 3,000 to 5,000 English words, you no longer sound them out. You just shape recognize it. Oh, that shape's cat. It's cat. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to skip it. I know the answer. And so it actually ends up being that we go to a logogram system. It'll be interesting. I'm kind of curious that if in 15, 20 years, emojis become their own logogram. You know how people like do a bunch of emojis in a row and it has particular meanings? I wonder if it's going to become a full logogram language over time. Anyways, that's all encoding, right? We go from idea to symbol, symbol back to idea. And we have to be able to know. Now the functions are obviously a little more complicated. It's just a, it's just a list of understandings. So learning another language, learning how to speak, learning to share ideas is a form of cryptography. That also tells you, especially when you read a math book and you don't know what the symbols are and you don't know what the words are, it's encrypted to you. It's encoded. It has no meaning, right? You have to somehow decode it, which means you need to learn the decryption function, right? Know all of the meanings and how this thing maps out and then you start to be able to tear it back apart. This is true of everything that you don't recognize. So we do this all naturally. Now, if we want to do it for secrecy systems, um, cryptographies are normally broken up into two groups. Public key versus private key cryptography. The first thing is private. Okay, so if I have a function of a plain text has spit out a cipher, the encryption is the encryption function f, c is the cipher, p is the plain text. Uh, what you must always assume in cryptography is that this has officially been stolen. You assume that the bad guy has the ciphered text, right? We, one form of supposed secrecy is, is black box, right? Don't tell anybody. Right? But you have to assume that everybody knows. The bad guy has your secret message. Just That's what you have to assume. The idea of a private key, crypto, is C is known. And what I mean by known, I mean known by the bad guys. And if F is known by bad guys, then... F inverse is trivial, in quotes, for them. Let's say my form of cryptography is I'm going to talk in Spanish. So I walk around and I'm talking in Spanish the entire time. I just assume everybody hears me speaking in Spanish. Right? If they don't know I'm speaking in Spanish, they would have to do some research and things like that, right? And so, But on the other hand, if they know I'm speaking in Spanish, is it trivial to decrypt it? Yeah, they just go find a Spanish speaker and have them walk up and say, what's Mark saying? Okay, he's saying that. Okay, thank you. 
I need a translator. Very easy to find. If it's trivial, then you better keep, if this is true, keep the function private. Classic examples for the Romans. They would have a slave. They would shave the back of his head. They would tattoo the message on the back of his head. They would let his hair grow back. Off you go. It's on the back of his head. He can't read it or anything else like that. He just needs to know he has to get to a particular place. Right? But if the other people know, as people walk by, they're, they're putting messages on the back of, their, of people's heads. How would you decrypt it? I don't know. I'd look at the back of their head. Right? World War I, you have a secret message. They're putting secret messages over Bert by pigeons. Really? There's a pigeon. What would you do? You'd shoot it. Right? And therefore, there are no more carrier pigeons. We killed them all in World War I. So... There's, you know, that particular breed. So if you better keep it secret, because if other people know about it, decrypting it is a very trivial thing. And so there's an entire class of things that must be kept private. Now, some of these are very, they're impossible to break codes by cryptanalysis, like one-to-one -one pads and other, you know, other types. We'll get into those types <clears throat> next time. And the second type is public. Public key is the issue of, okay, I'm going to take plain text and C and one, or sorry, I wanted to, A, C is known, again, by bad guys, and B, F is known, period. And this has to happen, for example, on uh, internet banking. You go and they say, look at the top of your web page, make, it, make sure it says HTTPS, which means you're talking encrypted to that website. How'd that happen? Did you actually go to that bank or that website in person and grab their super secret private key and took it back with you and that's what you're using for encoding? You never did that. So what must have happened? Before you started talking encrypted, you asked them in plain text, I need the entire encryption function. I need all of it. Well, if they send it to you, who has it? Everybody. Then you type in your password and hit enter. What gets sent back? The encrypted thing that you just sent over this thing using the entire function. So the bad guys have the function and the bad guys have C. The hope is, what makes this thing public is, but F inverse is not trivial to find knowing C and F. How in the world does this happen? What happens is you first create a true private Second, mix it up. In other words, I'm going to take my actual private key. I'm going to have some sort of mixing function, and out will pop a public key of some sort. And then three, F of P depends on the public key. Strength of public key cryptography is entirely based upon this mixing. The private key will be used to decode. In other words, I'm the bank. I create a pi private key and I keep this super secret. I take this private key, I mix it up in a particular mathematical way, I hand that mixed thing to everybody in the world. The problem is that mixed thing has inside of it my private keys that I was not supposed to tell anybody. So here's an easy example. The private key is actually two things. It's the number two and the number three. The public key is mixed by multiplying them and I get the number six. And this is what F uses 
this. So if I hand them the number six, did I actually hand them my private key? Sure. What's the only thing that's keeping it secret from that person? <laughs> that if they have six, they can't somehow figure out that it's actually two times three. Guess what? All forms of cryptography, the, the forms of cryptography that you're using to talk to your bank and everything else like that, this is, it's heart is this. Pick two primes, multiply them. That multiplied number is what you give the entire world. If anybody can factor that thing, all of your encrypted messages are broke. So we don't pick small primes. We pick really, 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 really big primes. So that computationally, factoring is, worst case scenario, you're going to have to check all of the factors. And it's going to take you 300 million years to factor this very large prime. And so that's what you do. You pick really large primes. Multiplying really large primes is not computationally expensive. Factoring them is. And so that's what we do. We just multiply it, hand that thing off, and hope that they can't factor. Within, but that also tells us that everything that we do will eventually be broke, period, given enough time. So it's only secure for a certain amount of time. It has an expiration date. So the types of crypto that we're going to do on these things is for the private that we're going to study, we're going to study... Um, Character ciphers, a lot of times these are called one-to-one -one replacement. Uh, those are going to be, we're going to talk about shift. We will talk about affine shift. We will talk about one-time pads. We'll talk about random one-to-one -one replacement. Random one-to-one -one replacement is this. Uh, A goes to Z, B goes Q, C goes D, right? Just randomly do it. Shift does that in a very specific way. Affine shift does that in a very specific way. One-time pads are based upon shift, but they are not one-to-one -one replacement, okay? What a one-time pad is, if you take a random noise add it to an actual code, you get random noise. But if I would subtract the random noise from that, I would get back the original code. So the one-time pad is randomness. And we'll do those. We'll also talk about a block cipher. And then for public, it is either called RSA. More appropriately, it should be called COX. Cops cryptography because he did it first. He just couldn't tell anybody because he was in a spy agency. And I didn't let anybody know that they had a form. You'll notice that the best people in this field and stuff like that that are undergraduates and graduates disappear. A lot of times, like, hey, look, you have amazing research, and all of a sudden they're gone. They got hired by somebody and they sit in a hole and they do cryptography that's hopefully about five to ten years faster than everybody else. Because all these things have ex expiration dates. And so these are all the types we're going to work on next class. Mm -hmm.